So, let us move on with this slide. This slide is essentially what I already showed you. Uh, what you see on the left side are three different types of RFID EPC Gen 2 tags. So, please remember this the National Highway Authority of India the tags that are applied there perhaps fall under EPC Gen 2. This is one type of tag, this is another type of tag, this is a third type of tag and then there is a fourth type of tag. All these different types of tags are all part of the EPC Gen 2. EPC means electronic product code generation 2 type of tags. Okay. This is one uh, technology which is part of RFID. Another technology which is part of RFID, uh, I mean it is confusing because you say what is another technology in RFID. You can think of RFID like an umbrella, different types of technology supported under this umbrella technology called RFID. Another technology is the near field communication okay. and what you see on the right side here is essentially this near field communication. Now, what are the key differences uh, in, uh, in these things? Well, I think that is important. We should know the key differences. So let me um, uh, let me explain to you uh, those key differences. In the uh, if you look at uh, the uh, the EPC Gen two, EPC Generation two, and if you look at NFC, both of them fall under the umbrella of. Okay, I think this will be a better picture to uh, draw. Let me redraw that. I will say RFID, I will put one arrow like this, I will put this as EPC generation 2 and another arrow I will put like this and call it uh, this is EPC, this is EPC dash, this is NFC. The key differences are although they form uh, under the umbrella of RFID, this uses ultra high frequency this work in the UHF range which means this is the sub 1 gigahertz range. Typically in India it is 865 okay, let me write it a little bigger this is 865 megahertz to 867 megahertz. Okay. This is the UHF range. This one operates in 13.56 megahertz, extremely close range okay. and uh, you can think about, um, think about it like this that uh, you can have a tag like this, you can have a tag like this, I mean I am just showing you a EPC Gen 2 tag but never mind for an example. Uh, if this is an NFC enabled phone, if you want to read this tag you have to do it like this almost in 1, 2 mm kind of spacing you have to do because this runs and how do you charge the, uh, uh, the uh, NFC tag? This is not through RF uh, range but this is inductive power transfer. Okay. The, so, you by induction you, uh, you have a coil and through induction you charge that uh, uh, the, uh, the, EP, the NFC coil, NFC sensor and then the NFC sensor will uh, backscatter the data back uh, onto the uh, uh, NFC phone enabled phone. So, that is uh, essentially what happens in the um, in the world of NFC. Okay. This again leads you to one more uh, competing uh, you know range, one more competing technology is uh, related to um, the okay. So, I must tell you that these two things uh, NFC is well known right, you know that it is NFC, but there is an ISO standard for them. There are two NFC ISO, so I will move this. Okay. You can say I will move this and show you that there are two ISO standards, one is called ISO 1443 and the other is ISO 15693. Okay. These are the two type of uh, standards um, and um, uh, you can have again there are differences between these two okay there are differences between these two iso 15693 uh, are those which uh, you can use it for medical applications medical applications 
and uh, typically this is uh, what people normally call as NFC okay NFC uh, systems ISO 13443 is uh, what you see in uh, public transport systems okay in public transport uh, public transport systems okay public transport several uh, you know European countries and uh, other places what you actually do is you carry like a credit card okay you have a credit card sized uh, let us say a card where uh, as you enter the bus there is a box that box essentially is the reader okay and this card need not be uh, shown against that it can be inside your purse also you have your purse money purse inside that purse there is a pouch for putting your card you take out your purse show it against the reader and then it enters the time when you entered the bus before you exit again you show it shows it will make a record of that and then it will tell you how long how many stops you went and uh, all that. So, it keeps again keeps track that is typical of ISO 13443 which are used in public uh, systems and there the range is slightly better because the uh, card is inside the purse right it is in the pouch of the purse. So, that gives you a better range, um, but then it is also in 13.56 please note I think this is the key point 13.56. The other application which uh, we will uh, spend time uh, is res with respect to medical applications and that is ISO 15693. So, uh, both of them fall under 13.56, but you have to know the differences you can have other applications by the way I just gave you one possible application. So, what we are showing you here is this if you go back to this slide if you look at this slide this antenna uh, is either uh, it is usually 15693 kind of antenna um, in any case antenna is uh, tuned for a given frequency right the ISO 13443 or ISO 693 is more of a protocol which is running behind. So, the ant this antenna can be used for both. Uh, 13443 as well as for 15693 whereas, what you see on the left side three of them 1, 2 and 3 are all these antennas uh, for the uh, UHF EPC generation 2 kind of tags. Now, I did mention to you about this RFID tags ok. Let us put back this tag and let us put back this reader here is a tag and here is a reader. Supposing I also mentioned to you that location is a very important uh, problem we did talk about that and we said GPS is the required and then you do step counting and all that we will come to that. But even here the look at the pro problem with the RFID it can give you the code that is sitting here if you throw RF energy it can give you the code, but it will not tell you where the reader will not know where this tag is nobody knows where the tag is. So, you need to do location estimation of tags that is a problem in RFID world and it can be a very challenging research problem and our labs have looked at that in, uh, in sufficient detail. So, uh, you must know how do you do location estimation of these tags right. So, one simple idea is supposing I have uh, this is a tag which is in the fixed location and I have this reader I read in one location and then I move it by a finite distance and I read it again. So, I have two distances d 1 and I have d 2 from here to here as well as from here to here with these two distances you can do some very simple calculations and that is essentially what I have captured here. Either you move this antenna to two positions or you have a single reader with two antenna that is also possible one next to the other you can think of uh, let me draw a picture. You can think of a reader to which you connect one antenna and another antenna. So, essentially you will have two ports for the antenna for the reader sorry you will have two ports for the reader. So, this is reader reader is uh, the piece of electronic this is ant 1 and this is ant 2 this is the same as supposing you have one reader you have the reader 
you have just one single antenna you have only ant 1 but you know that you read it here then you move this reader to another location. So, again you have reader 2 uh, reader uh, reader position 1 reader pause 1 and oops, this is reader pause 2 sorry this is reader pause 2 reader pause 2 pause 2 means what position 2 again this is the same antenna ant 1 this is reader position 2. So, if you know these if you move the reader to another position it is easy to uh, get a you, you can simply solve the system uh, we can get the you can get the coordinates solving the system we can get we can obtain the coordinates of the tag x y. So, you are interested in so let us look at this particular uh, picture here ok. So, you have two antennas at two different spatial locations uh, x 1 and um, x 1 y 1 and x 2 y 2 ok. This is nothing but antenna right this is nothing but antenna meaning it is nothing but the reader because if you have a single antenna uh, it can be like a reader moving from this position to this position or reader having antenna positioned here and another antenna positioned here. So, you x 1 y 1 and x 2 y 2 and then you know this angle. So, here is what you are you do not know you are interested in finding out the x y location you can easily get y 1 uh, the tan theta 1 that you have here uh, and tan this is the theta 1 right this is theta, theta 1 and this is theta 2. You do tan theta 1 you get this expression equation very simple equation and tan theta 2 you get this equation. Solving the system we can obtain the coordinates of tag x y ok very very simple ok. So, this is I think you should try this right very simple uh, um, the uh, expression for you to try. So, usually this is also called tan theta method for some reason anyway. So, uh, in fact that is the, the reason is it uses tan theta right. Um, so, very simple way of um, the of, of uh, localizing tags anything you want to know about localization of this nature you must look up one algorithm which I cannot forget it is called the music algorithm. Please look up music ok if you google for music you will find information on uh, localization all right. So, this is with respect to reader. Now, what about the mobile phone part see this is another interesting thing I said that if you move like this up down as you keep walking up and down you will see that the z axis is actually moving up and down plus you also have the y axis moving forward and of course, very little movement along the x axis. How does that signal look can I actually get a signature from it the answer is yes and look at this what I have done. Here is an IMU output that I have shown what I have shown you is on the x axis is time on the y axis is linear acceleration in meter per second square ok acceleration is measured as meter per second square right. So, this is your y axis look at these peaks look at these peaks this peak here ok I should show it with this this peak then this peak this peak this peak and this peak and this peak and look at this line here. So, it is easy for you now to say this is first step second step third fourth fifth sixth steps. So, six steps were taken by the human every time uh, the foot was put forward you got a peak then this is from the back back foot this is the front foot back front back front and so on. So, you see it is so easy now if you know the starting location of the x y location of the human and you know the steps that were taken then you actually know the uh, more or less know where the human is currently positioned without GPS there is a catch. What you do not know from this is what you do not know from this is the stride length that you do not know you only know the step count ok how much he covered nobody knows if it is a little kid you will get the same waveform if it is a 6 footer you will get the same waveform but 6 footers uh, stride length will be different from a little kid. So, this is not you, you will have difficulty but then you look at the waveform analyze the waveform 
may be you will get further information right and there are uh, out there uh, literature out there on how to estimate the stride length from an accelerometer. So, this is very very important you must know how to localize uh, systems uh, as well uh, either it is RFID technology or whether it is using mobile phone technology and so on. Other types of sensors are possible you can apply uh, as many different types of sensors to understand the uh, mapping and understanding the where the location is. So many radar systems for instance, LIDAR systems for instance look at them as devices which not only they give you a wealth of information not only about the surrounding environment, but they can also be used for the purposes of localization this is a important thing alright. So, let us move on then finally, we have to look at at least one or two nice examples of IOT we have not even shown you a good example of what an IOT is I am not going to show you the regular stuff that you may find on the internet if you say examples of IOT you will find, but I will show you some exciting stuff that we did in the lab and let me point you to this little video ok. This video is uh, by done by our students in the lab and what they are trying to do is let me play it you will see it for yourself ok. You see that the kids are putting uh, students are putting things together and this is a surprise and uh, here is a hydrogen cylinder and they are about to launch a hydrogen balloon ok there. So, you can see they are inflating a hydrogen balloon hydrogen has to be of extreme purity in order to give you a good lift and that is the payload that the student is attaching to it. So, he is attaching about 1.5 kgs payload they tie it up together and they are about to launch the helium uh, not hydrogen I am sorry it is not hydrogen this is helium uh, helium balloon helium should be of extreme uh, purity uh, in order to get a good lift uh, more than 99 percent there you go the helium balloon is going up the balloon is using a material called neoprene. So, these are neoprene balloons. Uh, they can go up to uh, a kilometer if not more high up in the space the payload is there and here is what you see is the building and what you saw there are solar panels. So, what is the big takeaway? The takeaway is you can use IOT devices you can embed these uh, you can have a payload which has IOT sensors in order to calculate let us say in this case the harvesting opportunity of the rooftop can be estimated using these things. You are interested in the green cover of your locality why not you try a helium balloon with required sensors connected to it connected to it. In this case we had applied camera sensors as well as Wi-Fi communication devices which were loaded uh, and then sent up. So, that as it goes up it starts beaming pictures down and you get an aerial survey of the whole thing and now this once it comes to the laptop or computer or wherever you can upload this data to the cloud and in real time people can either you can look at the streaming video or you can use this data to map in real time the harvesting opportunity available on the rooftop of a particular building. So, you can start collecting a lot of data from it. So, the point time we are trying to say is that the uh, the IOT applications are not just limited to land they can also be applied in space they can also be applied in terrestrial systems and so folks think about IOT uh, out of the box applications of IOT out of the box. So, that you will generate newer and newer uh, applications and for the betterment of uh, human beings. IOT is all pervasive ok today several devices and several appliances in our houses have all become IOT enabled refrigerators are IOT enabled fans are IOT enabled light bulbs LED light bulbs are IOT enabled. Why do you think they have to be done this way if you take fan and if you IOT enable it you will know that you can enable switch on switch off control speed with your mobile phone 
not just by sitting inside your home, but you can enable it for elderly people sitting in your office. You press a button, the fan will start. Uh, so, you do not need to be physically there to in order to enable all these uh, appliances. And in the evening, if you want to switch on the lights in your house, people use timers uh, and then program those timers to ensure that lights come up automatically when people are not in the house and all that you can do. But you can also do it this way right, you can see you can sit in the office and you can switch on the home uh, light uh, bulb by just sitting in the office uh, by, uh, by in, uh, in the evening time. You may want you can so many things can happen. You can also know the power consumption of these devices, how long you have kept it on, how long you have kept it off and you can actually learn from all the data that is getting uploaded and use the data to program to make things intelligent. After all, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, devices that have come related to uh, products like uh, you know thermostats and so on, uh, which have uh, come out from a company called Nest. Those devices are all basically learning devices, they have just collected data learned from the data that was collected and understanding patterns of humans and then ma making things easy for, for humans. Let me tell you that today for very economical prices you can buy these devices and start experimenting them at home. One such device which I saw on, on Amazon is right here, look at this, this says you can buy an Orient Electric Aero Slim 1200 mm smart premium ceiling fan with IOT remote and under light. Okay. You can buy this for about 9000 rupees. This is a device for the home, you can control all these devices from wherever you are. This is one part and I have one more in my hand, what is this? This you think is a lamp, yes it is, it is an LED lamp and it is IOT enabled. This is from Philips and there is a product called LeafX or LifeX as it is called. Okay. I do not know whether I should hold it this way, yeah you can see it here. This is uh, this way LifeX, look at this product, this you just google it you will understand what kind of uh, IOT, it is an outstanding IOT product. There are many clones for uh, this kind of product, you have cheaper products now. I heard that you can buy an LED lamp now today for IOT enabled LED lamp for 600 rupees, 5 to 600 rupees. Okay. So, things have invaded our, uh, our daily life and uh, everything is centered around the mobile phone, these devices can be controlled, data can be collected from these phones, you can learn from the data, put a model and learn from the data, come up with patterns and efficiently use these devices. You know when to switch on, when to switch off. It can you can add other sensors around you, ambient sensors and you can actually switch off these devices if you are not present, right. You can have uh, presence detector uh, sensors, PIR sensors for instance can be put. Enable those PIR sensors, see if there are humans, then keep the fan running, keep the light running. Otherwise, you PIR gives a signal and says, hey I do not find any humans around me, the fan is switched off, the light is switched off. This is one thing that you can do and learning from patterns and enabling things for comfort is very important. If the, if the light comes to know that you always come to the house at 6 o'clock or 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the evening and you do not want it to be dark, the lights can go on exactly at that time because they know that the owner of the house comes at that time. The owner they also know what should be the fan speed for a particular uh, for that owner, so they may want to start operating the fan at a particular fan speed. So, it can give you a lot of comfort, but you need to have a technology behind and that is where IoT actually plays a very important role. So, what is the summary? There is just no point today to make devices isolated. You have to connect devices to the cloud, you have to connect devices to the out, out. you should connect, they should be internet enabled. You should collect that data, you should analyze this data and you should come up with patterns, you should make it intelligent, make these devices intelligent. That is when you actually say that it is a full blown IoT solution.
Now, uh, just to give you an overview of uh, a IoT node and corresponding uh, its power consumption, it is a very complex uh, topic though okay? and uh, there are many aspects, uh, many facets of uh, the this particular aspect of power consumption in a node has to be looked up. Let me point you to a picture which I drew. It is not a complete picture, but it will at least tell you some interesting things about where all and how all you should control and look out for knobs which uh, allow you to keep the node uh, in terms of its long lifetime, right? extended lifetime. We said nodes have to live for 10 plus years and they are, can be battery driven or they can be energy harvested. So, how do you ensure what are all the places, hooks and levers that are available to you to ensure that your system is an, uh, performing well under the required budget, energy budgets. Here is a picture. If you take a typical microcontroller SOC, you will have this section on the left side which is called LDO dash divided by DC DC. It is actually not divided, it is either this or that. Okay. You supply power to a controller, it may supply the output power, output voltage either using DC DC or low dropout regulator. Typically these are buck converters, these are switching buck converters. When I say DC DC, I mean here buck converters. Okay. Now this V out that comes from here is actually used for powering all the different blocks, okay. all these blocks are powered using this V out. Now we know that any uh, switching regulator or any switching system is highly energy efficient, efficient. If you want high energy efficiency greater than 90 percent or so, you obviously have to choose a switching regulator and to that extent the DC DC converter is a definitely a good choice for lowering the power, lowering the power consumption of the SOC. But then DC DC converters while they do that they also introduce switching noise. The output current the output current has a ripple. Now if the ripple is uh, high, uh, then any sensor that is connected to this uh, uh, to the ADC port under the presence of this ripple, you will not be able to detect an extremely low signal that is coming. Typically, if you are looking at uh, medical sensors, medical application sensors, ECG probes, EEG electrodes and so on, those have very small voltages coming out. Okay. The sensed values are very, very small which requires a pre-amplifier in fact, right there you have to amplify and then transmit it. That uh, itself can be a problem if you are powering through a output which is based on a ripple ripple based uh, output coming from a DC DC converter. So your choice of uh, whether it should be uh, a switching regulator or a linear dropout regulator which is an LDO will largely depend on the kind of sensors that you are going to connect here. If they are purely digital sensors which are connected to these digital ports then you will not have much issue with respect to the uh, choice of switching regulators which are embedded inside the SOC module. So this is the first point. Okay. So you have to look at oh, should I use this or should I use that so that you will be able to look at it from the power perspective. Now this SOC itself has two parts right one is the controller the other is the radio. The SOC itself will support controller itself will support multiple low power modes okay. and you have to look at their uh, low power modes 
and use them configure them appropriately. Any data sheet with respect to the controller of interest which has an embedded radio will support low power modes. So, please look up the low power modes of the low of the uh, microcontroller as well as the radio. The next point is this is an equation which I am sure you might have seen many times. This is the static power consumption of the controller of the SOC and this is the dynamic power associated with the SOC. If you put the system to uh, very low power then the power con the current consumption is minimal okay. This is the minimal current consumption point that means the power consumption due to static also comes down comes down and uh, if you are uh, operating it at a low frequency the crystal clock frequency is low again then the power consumption is low that is with respect to dynamic power consumption. Power consumption continues to be low even if you have an operating voltage which is uh, significantly low. If you have 2 volt or let us say 3 volts, if you take a 3 volt VCC 3 squared is 9 whereas if you take 4 volt you have 4 squared that is 16 right. So, you can see that the power consumption by just a 1 volt change operating voltage change of 1 volt bloats up the power like anything right. So, uh, you have to be uh, watchful of the fact that your operating voltage also has a bearing on the dynamic power consumption. This is the switching capacitance uh, it will also have an impact and it is usually mentioned uh, the C is the switching capacitance. If you are operating at lower frequency it will have lower power consumption, but the time to execute uh, will also increase right because you are not operating it at high speed. So, there are trade offs of uh, operating it at low frequency as well as the time it requires to compute something uh, some value. So, this is point number 1. Point number 2 I mentioned is all about the low power modes. Point number 3 is about data acquisition folks many times you ignore this that is the problem and I want to point out a very important thing here. When you write your ADC driver for acquisition of data whether you should send a command to the sensor whether sensor is here right it is connected to one of the I will show it slightly bigger so that or I should show this smaller this is a smaller port this is also a very small one and I will show a sensor which is slightly larger ok. This is your sensor. If you write your code such that you are asking the sensor, you are asking you are configuring the ADC to obtain the data and you are waiting for the system to respond back with its data via the ADC it comes back to this code here. So, it is writing in RAM right. This can be horrible if something goes wrong with this sensor node. If the sensor fails or malfunctions you are eternally waiting which means the CPU is in on state okay, and you are burning away significant amount of power which is going back to this equation 1 right. It is now on for a longer time because energy is to be calculated uh, power times the time right. So, your energy burning starts increasing and this you have to keep a note. Uh, so, how do you write your driver? How do you write your driver such that it just uh, you give a command and wait for the sensor to respond back and take the data whenever the sensor responds rather than you waiting for the data to come back. You proceed with other activities and only once the data comes back uh, you start processing the data which means polling or interrupt which one should you choose ok. Polling is simple very simple you can do, but uh, if something goes wrong uh, you are in trouble uh, the energy consumption can go up drastically. Interrupt is good, but interrupt is hard to configure interrupt handlers have to be written and it is a little more work it is not hard it is in a way 
it is a little more work for you to do. Also ADC requires a clock right ADC requires a clock to convert the analog data to digital data. Uh, if you do not choose the clock frequency appropriately the conversion time will increase from analog to digital the conversion time will increase lower clocks will increase the conversion time. If the conversion time increases the processor is on for a longer time which means again the power consumption goes up here right. So, this uh, this, power, this term will continue to uh, start blowing up because in terms of time this is another thing. Then the controller itself you can choose between uh, internal oscillator and or external oscillator. Now if you choose an internal oscillator you typically come with an RC oscillator which is built into the uh, system you do not need to connect anything externally right. So let me show this as another block. So you will have a RC oscillator as part of the block here. Oops, I should make it touch this so that you know it is part of the silicon itself the RC oscillator is there. But RC oscillator is unstable and uh, for temperature variations it can change and can drift. So you have problems of drift and uh, its ability to scale up to higher frequencies is limited. So RC oscillators you choose when your frequencies are low, low operating frequency or low clock frequency requirements choose RC oscillator because it is energy efficient and uh, it is uh, at, but at the same time it has other issues uh, that it can have a drift and so on. Whereas you can also use a crystal oscillator uh, by supplying an external crystal you need an external crystal means number of components go up cost might go up but you will not have drift problem the clock is stable and uh, it has the ability to uh, you know uh, work over a range of frequencies okay. So that is a good thing about the application of uh, external clock of course it has issues of um, you know higher power consumption and so on. So again make a note whether you want to choose internal RC oscillator or whether you want to choose uh, the internal oscillator or the external clock again has a bearing on this power okay. Then in general if you have digital ports you may want to transfer data using either a UART port or SPI port or I2C port each one of them have their own advantages okay. If you choose I2C uh, typically these are uh, open uh, collector outputs and uh, they need uh, some sort of additional circuitry in terms of pull up resistors and so on. And uh, the advantage is you will get only two, uh, two, uh, two pins uh, typically they are called SDA and SCL uh, whereas SPI can be either 3 wire or 4 wire interfaces but gives you much higher speed compared to UART. So UART is so whether you want to choose a UART or whether you want to choose SPI or I2C again has a bearing on the power. Now if you take UART uh, it is a slow device right you have a device that is connected to uh, a load that is connected let us say a display system okay and this display is connected over UART and you are waiting for it to get the data so that it can display something on the screen. Maybe it is not a good idea to choose UART because data rate transfer there will be a lot of data to go on to a display system and uh, you have to transfer it quickly. To do that UART is not a good idea because again power consumption will increase because your transfer rates are limited. Maybe you should go in for SPI so that you will be able to uh, finish the transfer quickly. I did not discuss this DMA I will come to the DMA in a little detail but at this stage it is also important for you to note that acquisition of data from the ADC uh, and writing to memory that sensed value need not bring the, uh, the uh, CPU to active state it can continue to remain in a sleep state because DMA is configured to get the data like this onto the memory and then issue an interrupt then it can issue an interrupt to the CPU 
So, these techniques essentially will give you ultra low power operation. Uh, this is just broadly telling you the possibilities, the levers and hooks that you have to choose to uh, improve the energy efficiency of your um, of your embedded IoT node. So, that is all I have. Uh, this last picture is telling you about the duty cycle. Any time you put the system to sleep, it goes to off state. This on state is the time when it consumes some current. So, this is I and this is time on the x axis here, this is time. So, you can see the duty cycle typically is T on by this simple expression T on by T on plus T off. So, if you keep your uh, on time low, that means you can uh, ensure that nodes can sleep for a extended period of time. So, folks this is an overview of uh, the power, we have to go into each one of these details uh, and understand them drill down to some some amount of detailing uh, before we know how to configure systems for 10 plus years of lifetime. How to characterize the CPU, which CPU to choose, why did we choose this, we did not write anything about the CPU here, what is that parameter and all that. As we go along we will try to understand, thank you very much.